scripture reading this morning is Psalm 100. You'll find that on page 611 in the Pew Bibles. Let's all turn there together. Psalm 100. Please follow along as I read. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. We're here this morning to to hear the word of God proclaimed. So would you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5? Our focus this morning will be on verse 19. We will talk of 20 as well, and we'll look elsewhere. But Ephesians 5, 19 will, will serve as, as the, the focus of our time. Already up to this point, we began the song portion, the singing portion of our worship, the song that, that called us to sing, Come, Christians, Join to sing. That was the admonition that we gave to one another as we were singing that song. A little bit later, we turned to Psalm 100, and we were told to enter his gates with thanksgiving. We were to enter God's presence with singing. We are called to sing to God. So it may surprise you then to hear this event from church history I'm about to point out, a decision was made at the Council of Laodicea. This is in 367 AD. And there was a very interesting decision that was laid down at this time. I'll, I'll read a translation. Besides the appointed singers who mount the ambo and sing from the book, others shall not sing in the church. There was a ban on congregational singing at this council of Laodicea. An ambo, you know, that could either be an ambulance or it could be referring to kind of like a a choir loft. It kind of faced two sides that faced one another. And so the the singers were to to gather in the ambo and they were trained and they were to sing, but everyone else was forbidden from singing. Some pretty helpful decisions made at Laodicea. This was not one of them. The worship of the church ought to be characterized by active participation. As we gather, we sing and we pray and we hear the word proclaimed and we are active participants in what is going on as we gather in our worship. But early in the church, I think this council had a lot to do with it, but also other things that go on throughout the Middle Ages and on all the way up through into the 16th century, much of what would characterize church life was not active participation, but passive spectatorship. You just had spectators standing back, looking on, really not even knowing what's being taught, what's being sung, and they would just sit back and passively observe uh, rather than actively participate. In the 6th century, here's another illustration of this, The Pope at the time, he had so regulated the worship of the church that he had mandated what songs were to be sung and who would do the singing. Uh, The approved songs that would be sung, they were sung in unison. They are stunningly beautiful to to characterize the music. I'm not saying that I've heard all of it. I'm just saying Gregorian chant. If you're familiar with it, we'd love to listen to Gregorian chant, but this, uh, this mandate was um, given by the Pope, Pope Gregory. That's why we refer to it as Gregorian chant. And while the music was beautiful, and while it might be something that you've listened to, uh, it's error-filled, okay? And then um, there, there's, there's much in the church that was error-filled. The, the music was biblically flawed, but so was so much of the church practice at the time. And let me just kind of point out a few things of what was so error-filled about this Gregorian chant. The congregation, for one, 
was not involved. The congregation was not allowed to sing. We just read Psalm 100. We just sang this hymn. Come Christians, join to sing. Psalm 149 begins, Sing to the Lord a new song, His praise in the assembly of the saints. The congregation is to be involved. The congregation is to be singing to one another. And so just standing back and listening to well-trained choirs sing things that you don't understand is not spiritually helpful. Psalm 149 is just one of at least 50 commands too to, uh, for us to sing to God, praises to God. So the church's practice, it, it literally prevented the church from being faithful to, to God's commands. When God has called us to sing when we gather in the assembly of the saints and the church had forbid the congregation from being faithful to that command. So, problematic, unhelpful, dangerous. Another reason, singing is important, but singing is not the main event. We, we gather to hear the word proclaimed. It's not the pri- singing is not the primary focus of our gathering. The preached word is the focus of our gathering. And, and in these Middle Ages, the, the gathered church, the highlight was outside of the preached word, and the preached word was not faithful. But what the focus was was on singing and other things that would be looked forward to rather than the priority of preaching. So when you exalt other things and diminish the preached word, you have a very unhealthy environment in the life of a church. And so music superseded preaching. Music took precedence. Another error was that while the singing overtook the preaching and the singing was passively observed rather than actively sung, it was also inaccessible. You didn't know what you were hearing. You didn't understand it. It wasn't in the language of the people. So how unhelpful would this be to be in a place where the priority and the focus is on things that you don't understand and things that you're unable to participate in? Something needed to change. And perhaps a reformation needed to happen, right? So here we are this month where we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And, and we rightly remember the reformers who, who, who um, faithfully defended the gospel. They defended justification by faith alone. They, they appealed to the authority of Scripture and the sufficiency of Scripture. But we also owe a debt of gratitude to them for their efforts in in defending congregational singing. In fact, Martin Luther, who we know, you know, is this monk with a mallet who nails 95 theses to the church door at Wittenberg, but he's also referred to by many as the father of congregational singing. He wrote 38 hymns. He was actively involved and gave much effort into the publication of hymnals with a desire to see the people of God singing amongst the people of God, songs that were biblically faithful, songs that they understood, and songs that edified the Lord, or worshipped the Lord. And so he did much to promote congregational singing. The, the Lord used him mightily in many ways. We think of Bible translation. We think of, of volumes that he wrote. So much of his, his, many of his commentaries, much of his theological Volumes are so helpful to the church today, but it's interesting to hear of a contemporary of his, one of his theological enemies, would say this about Luther. As much as we benefit from his Bible translation and his sermons, here's what this individual said. Luther has done more harm, he's done us more harm through his songs than he has through his sermons. So, so those who did not appreciate Luther's reform viewed his songs as very unhelpful because it got the truth into the minds of the people. I don't think Luther would agree with this guy's assessment, and I'm not sure I do either, but it is significant to notice how many recognize Luther's efforts in congregational singing and the, the, um, the trajectory that that placed into the life of the church as the people began to sing faithful songs that they knew what it meant. So anyway, Luther, as I said, he, he wrote a lot of hymns, he, uh, he was actively involved in publication hymnals for people. Keith Getty, in his book titled Sing, uh, writes the following about Luther. He believed that a truly biblical church would be one where every believer was actively participating in every part of the service. Actively participating in every part of the service. 
So Luther would then say, let God speak directly to his people through the scriptures and let his people respond with grateful songs of praise. So here's what Luther desired to see in the life of the church. Let God speak directly to the people. How? Through the word of God, through the scriptures. And then our response in hearing God proclaim his excellencies to us through his word, our response is with grateful songs of praise. So in a movement where authority of scripture led the way, it's no surprise that congregational singing was very important because the word of God has much to say about the people of God and their singing. We are to be a singing people. As believers, we're reconciled to the Father through the Son, and we have much to sing about in light of the gospel. But not only do we have much to sing about, we are commanded to sing. We're compelled to sing through what God has done. We are commanded to sing through God's word. And so that's where we'll find ourselves this morning in Ephesians 5, 19 and 20. This section, it's placed within a, a, a part of Ephesians. You know, earlier this morning we were singing Ephesians. Uh, come praise and glorify our God. We were reminded of what God has done through Christ uh, to save and reconcile sinners. He has, he, has, he has opened our eyes to trust in Christ. We are reconciled to the Father and it is to his praise. It is to the glory of Christ. to to know of the gospel. And so then as you move through Ephesians, you then see uh, these these characterizations of Christians, what it looks like to be a normal Christian. And amongst this list of normal Christian living is the practice of singing. Just as normal as it is for believers to submit to one another, just as normal as it is for a Christian to be thankful to God, it's normal for a Christian to be a singer. So, the obedient Christian is a singing Christian. So, my sermon this morning, I will be preaching to the choir. Our plan will be to answer the following questions. Why do we sing? That'll be an important place to start. Why? Why do we sing? To whom do we sing? What are we to sing? And how are we to sing? So, why do we sing? To whom do we sing? What are we to sing, and how are we to sing? Ephesians 5, verse 19. We sing because we are commanded. I'll start back in verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk. Ephesians 5, 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So I think you see there in verse 19, this command to sing. We are to address one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody. That this word that, that I, I read, I'm reading the ESV. Many of you are probably like, likely reading another translation, but this word that, that is translated as addressing one another comes from a word, la leo, like, la, 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 you know, like do, re, mi, fa, so, la, la, you know, when you hear la, it's an onomatopoeia, you think of singing, you know, the, the word defines what it sounds like, it's, it's defined as what it sounds like, and so you have la leo here to utter a sound, And so the ESV says addressing one another. Other translations say speak to one another. Both are faithful uh, translations of the word. But as you move through and you see that, that Paul writes that the Ephesians are to address one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, how do you normally utter songs? Through singing. And as you continue to move through, he even says singing and making melody. So we're not just talking mere... As helpful as it is, and as appropriate as it is to read hymns, psalms, spiritual songs, absolutely, we read them to one another, but we really are commanded here to sing them to one 
another. And it's not the only place this command is found. It's not like I'm just pulling this one place out and say, see how important this is? It would be important if it's in here once, but it's all over the place in the scriptures. Paul, this is not the only place he talks about it. If you look over at a parallel passage, which we will look at quite a bit this morning, Colossians 3, 16, um, turn over to the right just a little bit. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So Paul, writing Ephesians and Colossians very close together in a timeline, and he writes pretty much the exact same thing to the Ephesians that he does to the Colossians. And here in in Colossians he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So when we read in Ephesians 5 that we are to utter sound with our psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another, this is the command to sing. Let's uh, look at a few psalms real quick just to be reminded of this command. Everybody turn back. If if you're new to the Bible, uh, you'll you'll find maybe close to the middle of your Bible, you'll find the book of Psalms. You might just want to flip around here to try and find. We're probably going to look at five or six Psalm 9, verse 11. Let's all turn there. Psalm chapter 9, verse 11. Psalm 9, 11 says, Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. Chapter 30, verse 4. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. Chapter 33, verse 1. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. Chapter 47, chapter 47, verses 6 and 7, sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises, for God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with a psalm. If I was sitting down with my family at the table at night and we read this passage and I'd ask my boys to make an observation, I'd say, you hear two words a lot in these two verses. What would they be? Sing praises. We are commanded to sing. Singing is a matter of obedience, but know this, that God's commands, the command to sing and every other command of God is always for our good. It's always for our good to be obedient to God it's, it's a blessing to us to be able to sing to our God. In one of John Newton's hymns, he says the following, Our pleasure and our duty, though opposite before, before we were in Christ, the, our pleasure and our duty, those things were not related, though opposite before, since we have seen his beauty, are joined to part no more. That's a beautiful line to think that, as believers, we're commanded to sing, but in the fact that we have seen of God's beauty, we delight in singing his praises. He commands us to sing, but we delight in singing. What a fantastic and helpful quote. We ought to sing it uh, sometime. But uh, again, at the beginning, earlier we were singing, come Christians join to sing, and there's a very helpful line in there. It says, praise is his gracious choice. God has chosen to to command us to praise his name. It's a gracious choice of his to command us to to come together as Christians and join to sing. It's his gracious choice. He's commanded us to do so, and it's no surprise then that you find singing all over the place in the scriptures. Uh, People sing when they're delivered from Egypt. People sing before and after battles. People sing when they're in prison. People sing all types of emotions. Uh, 
our Lord sings at the Last Supper. Lots of songs, lots of singers. God's people are to be a singing people. And it's true, not all singers are Christians. (laughs) Uh, Not all singers are Christians, but all Christians are singers. Not all churches that sing are healthy churches, but all healthy churches are singing churches. This ought to inform our gatherings. And this next point then is, to whom do we sing? We answer the question, why? Well, we're compelled to, but we're, we're in fact commanded to. That's why we sing. But another important thing to recognize is, well, then who, who are we to sing to? To whom do we sing? And this question may actually be answered in a little bit more of a complex way than you might initially think. Surely, our songs are to God. We praise God alone, for praise is due his name alone. We praise God. This vertical reality, we praise God, is obvious to us. We know that that's who our songs are to be directed towards. But verse 19 of Ephesians 5 really does provide for us a very significant piece of instruction in regards to our singing. It begins by saying, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There is a horizontal reality to our singing. One another. I'm mindful of you, you're mindful of me. As we're singing together, uh, Colossians describes it as instruction and admonishment that's taking place in our congregational singing. There's horizontal realities to our songs. The praises we offer up to the Lord, that there's vertical praise to God, but there is horizontal instruction to one another. This really ought not surprise us very much. I, I think it does surprise me in some way as I, as I find myself thinking about this. My, my initial thought is to think when we sing, we sing to God. There's even songs that say like, to my audience of one. You know, that's kind of like our mentality. It's between me and God. I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to worship God alone. Please don't disturb me. You know, that, that's kind of like our mentality. But that is not what's going on. Ephesians 5 is saying we ought to be mindful of one another. So we sing songs that point to this truth all the times. Who are you, all the time. Who are we talking to when we say, come Christians, join to sing? You're admonishing one and encouraging, instructing, correcting those who aren't singing. Come, join, sing. That's what we're saying. How firm a foundation. Do you know that what we're saying there? We're saying promises from God to one another. So, so the, the statements that you're singing when you sing How Firm a Foundation, you're not really singing them to inform God about what he said. You're singing them to one another, informing one another. Here's what God has said, and here's what we ought to believe. So we're singing to one another. Oh, church, arise. We're talking to the church. Come, people of the risen king. Behold our God. We're, we're singing to one another another. And so the lesson here then is that that we really ought to be mindful when we gather of one another. As you are singing, God may be using you in the life of another to to encourage them, to build them up. I hope to have time at the end to apply this a little bit. But uh, let's go back to this vertical purpose. Our songs are to be sung mindful of one another but the content and the praise is due to God alone. Vertical praise. Our songs are to be thanksgiving to the Lord. Verse 20 says, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Earlier in 19, it says, making melody to the Lord with your heart. So songs like come praise and glorify, there's this horizontal thing where we're saying, hey, come, praise and glorify. Then the, then the chorus there, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his mercy and grace, you're the God who saves. We are praising God for who he is, and we're encouraging one another to think about these things. There's vertical and horizontal purposes to our singing. So, holy, 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 praise to God. Wonderful, merciful Savior, O God of our salvation, songs of our triune God, praise to him, praise to the Lord as we are commanded here in Ephesians 5. 
Now, there's something interesting, though, that helps us with, with a, a proof of the deity of Christ that's going on here. If you look at 19, and it says that we're to sing and make melody to the Lord with your heart, and then if you were to flip over to Colossians 3, you see the exact same instruction, except that, that Paul says there, to God. And so what's significant to me is there is no problem with this. That is, that is a, our praise is rightly directed to the Lord, just as our praise is rightly directed towards God. It's very clear in the scriptures that worship is to be to God alone. It's idolatrous to praise and glorify anything other than our triune God. But yet Paul says to the Ephesians, direct your praise to the Lord. And in Colossians, direct your praise to God. It's right to sing to the Son because the Son is God. We praise our triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. There's, your, there's an answer here in this text. Why do we sing and to whom do we sing? Now let's move to what exactly are we to sing then? We're supposed to sing. and we, We're supposed to sing to one another. We're supposed to sing praises to God. What should fill our praise? What what song should we sing? And three terms are used here, both in Colossians 3 but and Ephesians 5 as well. Address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Well, what's a psalm? That's not very tricky because we have so many examples. We have the Psalter to look to. We have the book of psalms. But, but a definition here of psalms is a song of praise to God. And so, indeed, the book of Psalms is our prototype. This is our example. This is where we go to, to look and say, what, what, is, it, what is a psalm? We're commanded to sing psalms. What are they? Well, we have a pretty good example of them, and we ought to be very mindful of them, and we ought to sing them. But even Paul will use the same term in a more general way to just speak of, of um, psalms that we have to sing to one another, each of us has, you know, our own psalm. We have a song of praise to God. But, but indeed, if you're thinking, oh, what does it look like for a church to sing psalms together? God be merciful to me. Psalm 51, this morning, we were singing a psalm together, and it ought to characterize our worship. We're also not limited to one type of song. We also are to sing hymns. Well, what is a hymn? I mean, anything that's in a hymn book, I guess, right? But no, no, no that, that's not it. You know, it's certainly not uh, the hymn to the garnet and gold. No, these are hymns to our God. Hymns of praise to our God. Really defined in a very similar way to Psalms. If you're looking at a definition of what it is to, to, to sing hymns, it's to sing praises to God. And, and uh, let's do this quickly, but we have several examples in the New Testament of hymns of what is likely uh, snippets of hymns that the early church would have known and would have sung together. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, very familiar text. Let's, let's quickly look at three examples of just hymns in the New Testament. Philippians 2, 6 through 11 who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Turn a page or two to the right. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Uh, Boy, I should keep reading, but let's, let's flip over to 1 Timothy. So that's just a beginning of, of a snippet there in Colossians. 1 Timothy 3, 1 Timothy 3, 16. Great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. And here's the confession that Paul appeals to 
what is likely a hymn that would have been very familiar to his readers. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. More than likely, we have examples here of hymns that the early church would sing. Very Christocentric hymns. They're about Christ, what he has done, what he has accomplished for our own good and for his glory. We're to sing psalms, we're to sing hymns, and we're to sing spiritual songs. What are those? And it's really, it's not my intention to be able to distinguish uh, between uh, these three terms in a real, real um, precise way here, because I really, I really am convinced, and I bet a month ago I was really looking for, you know, three definitions that, that show us, here's what a psalm looks like, here's what a hymn looks like, here's what a spiritual song looks like, but I really think that these are just three terms that point to the wide range of singing that ought to characterize the life of the church. There's a wide range of singing. And so even if, if, you, were to, if you were to turn over to, to Revelation chapter 5, you'd see a song that is sung. If you want to talk about spiritual songs, and this in Revelation 5 is described as a song, an ode to Christ. Revelation 5, 9 Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. Well, I should have read the beginning of nine, I'm sorry. And they sang a new song. So this same word, song, that is talked about in Ephesians 5. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Revelation 15, 3, also an example of songs that are sung in the presence of our Savior. Uh, I hear you flipping through there, but go ahead and just go to Ephesians 5. What does it look like then to sing a psalm and a hymn and a spiritual song? In what context do we do such singing? And I think, I think it just makes a whole lot of sense to recognize that uh, the... Um, the obvious, most likely setting for encouraging and addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs ought to be when we gather as believers together. We ought, our times of worship are to include singing, and, and we're to be involved in singing these songs to one another. But uh, it's certainly not limited to just when we gather. Your lives are to be characterized by singing. Um, This may be a relief to you, but I don't think it's a call for our lives to look like a musical. Or, how are you doing today? And instead of just somebody saying, good, they like bust out in a song that that we'd all find kind of awkward and not very helpful. So I'm not saying that I love musicals. In fact, I I love, you know, the sound of music even. I I guess that's dangerous just to admit something like that in front of everybody. (laughs) But I enjoy it every time I watch it. I, I like it. Cannot tell you how annoying it would be for that to characterize my parenting, though. 7.30 at night, let's go to bed, go to bed. You know, it's like, we're not going to sing so long for all, no, we're just going to bed and we're not going to sing about it. But, so so our lives don't have to look like we're always singing and answering each other with song. But my goodness, think of how many times people have encouraged you with, with a song, and maybe you've even gathered with individuals in your home, other places, and you've sung together. In the, uh, you're in a, in a hospital setting and, and someone is, and it is, is dying and, you, and you're singing together hope that is found in Christ through song. I, I mean, I, I hope that, that that's something that you have experienced and you've seen the addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs outside the context of just the local church. In fact, we recognize everything that takes place in our worship ought to be taking place in our life. It's not a Sunday-only type of thing. So the only time you open up the book is Sunday morning. You're not word-based. The only time you pray is when you gather together. You're not a very prayerful person. If the only time you sing is when we gather, I don't think you're characterized by what Ephesians 5 says characterizes a Christian. And so I'm not trying to make some strong judgmental statement without knowing all the facts here, but man, I think Americans struggle with singing. And so let's recognize that. 
there's so many other contexts where, they, where, where you sing in every circumstance. So, so when they are saved, someone from another culture is already a singer. But for us as Americans, and particularly as men, when you're saved, you have much to learn because you, you, you're coming into a setting where singing is not something I do and I'm not going to do it. You know, I mean, that's an attitude that has, the Word of God needs to break into that, convict you, and see the importance of, it's not about you, and you need to be singing to one another to, to encourage and build up one another. Well, I'm going to go ahead and move on. Um, no, I'm not. I, man, uh, just um, a few weeks ago, um, several of us in here were, were sitting in a room and Johnny Erickson Tata is giving her testimony. And her testimony is a testimony of, of song <laughs> encouraging her in the midst of, of tremendous trial. 50 years of, of being paralyzed. And she points through every event in her life of how songs have come alongside. Biblical songs. Songs that point her to Christ and her hope in Christ. To battle depression when she's laying in the hospital just learning of her affliction as a teenager and a friend who sneaks in to lay next to her and sing Man of Sorrows, and then to just continue to point all the songs that she has been encouraged by, and she encouraged us to sing with her. And it was such a powerful moment that I was, would characterize as what Paul is saying in Ephesians 5, 19. Let's sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another. We're commanded to... And we know who we're supposed to sing to. We know what we're supposed to sing and even a little bit about where we're supposed to sing. Let's finish out then with how. How do we sing? Studied music, actually, at Florida State. I came here as a singer. I love to sing. But what I'm about to say was not one time any sort of instruction that was given in the School of Music in in vocal training. And it ought not be because this is spiritual counsel here. How do we sing? Well, I don't need to talk about technique. I don't need to talk about anything that, that, uh, that teaches us how to vocally make sounds. Ephesians 5.19 tells us how we are to sing with our heart. We are to sing with a thankful heart. Our heart refers to the real you. Your songs are to be genuine. Your songs are to be heartfelt, sung with genuineness. Um, I was reminded by, by another song leader recently, a warning of how what we sing can often make us hypocritical. And uh, turn turn to Mark 7. Turn to Mark 7 just to to be warned of of, uh, honoring God with our lips only and not with our heart, how offensive that is to him. So in Ephesians 5, when we're told to sing with our whole heart, the real you, we're, we're reminded of Mark 7, Mark 7, verses 6 and 7. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Oh, may this not be true of our singing where we honor him with our lips, but our hearts are far from him. How do you sing? You sing with genuineness. You sing with your heart to the Lord. An illustration of what it would look like to sing just with your lips and not with your heart could look even like something that happens in our home. Often uh, when when our children are instructed to go clean their room, sometimes they sing this song that that so many know, you know, that clean up, clean up, everybody do your chair. You know, well, that's cute, and that's fun, and maybe it helps you like clean as you're cleaning, but you know how bothered I'd be if I hear that song, and I walk into the room, and they're playing while they're singing clean up, clean up? You know, that's what, that's what God is saying here. You, you say one thing, and your heart is far from me. It's offensive to him. Our songs are to be genuine. We sing because we mean it, and, and so we ought to be characterized by genuine singing. We have so much to sing about, because we have so much to be thankful for. Why we sing, it's how, uh, what informs who we sing to. It informs um, what 
we're supposed to sing this passage. I'm saying it. Ephesians 5 is informing us of all of these things. And Ephesians 5 reminds us of how we are to approach God in song. Because, because it, an excuse for not singing can't be the, the quality of the sound that comes out of your mouth. You know, I don't know how to sing. Well, well take comfort in laleo, meaning utter a sound. <laughs> That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to utter a sound. And, 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 um, and it says singing and making melody to the Lord. Well, opinions are fun, but they're not always helpful in, in preaching. So I'm a little nervous here. I, I feel like we must spend a little bit of time applying what we've just learned and speaking to a few things. But, but, but this is a subject that I'm opinionated about, which is probably true about a lot of things. And I really, there, there's no, man, there needs to be grace in this. So I'm hoping all the application that, that I say is, is more closely tied to application of, of the text than just preferences of my own. But I think we would benefit from thinking through, if we've just answered these questions of, of the why, the who, the what, the how, I have to think, well, what, what might that look like in our church? How could we, Grace Church of Tallahassee, excel still more in our singing? And so I think I, I just, I, I've prayed about this, I've thought through this, and there's four things that I think we ought to consider this morning. The first one, I made an effort not to look at, at the back door at the beginning of the service. So I'm not, I don't have anyone's um, image in my mind when I say this, but be on time to church. The, the, the scriptures speak of the body of Christ as being, you, you are an indispensable part of the body of Christ. And so then you see in Ephesians 5 that you, this indispensable part of the body of Christ, is called to sing to one another. And then, you, you, if you are not here when we're singing to one another, you are missing out on command from God. So, so take that, you know, gracefully, lovingly, uh, just consider that. Because I would imagine that a mentality is not present in the life of our church to, to be here to sing, and then after we're done singing, and whoever is preaching stands up to preach, and, and you leave. You know, and you're right to not do that because you're recognizing I need to hear the preached word. And that is the priority and why we gather. But man, the scriptures are telling us we are to sing to one another. So, so don't miss out on that. And don't look around next week for, for people who, who are late because you don't even know <laughs> why they're late. They, thankfully, we have so many people serving our church in so many different ways. And so whether it's security or nursery or um, just even the ushers. There, there are many people that, that have things that they must do to serve the church so that we can focus our thoughts and praise on God. So, so don't just start you know, thinking things when people walk in after 1045. But for, for you, and, I, and man, I'm not even saying don't be late ever. I'm just saying let's not be characterized. By, evaluate that. Sit back and think, am I characterized by this one another mentality of singing to one another when we gather so, so be here and be on time. I think there's a variety of things that, that we even as a church leadership ought to think through and how to make that easier. Even for me, I often find myself, after, maybe after announcements are given, then, then I'm running around and, and doing this, that, and the other, and I'm missing out on the time where we're supposed to be singing to one another. So I need better planning on my part to do these other things so that when we sit down to gather, uh, we, we focus on Christ as we admonish and instruct one another. So let's be on time. Let's be here and let's, let's just take that as a, um, just a helpful encouragement to, to evaluate our, our active involvement as we participate. There's no counsel um, on us to not sing congregationally now. We are to sing congregationally. Let's, let's sing together. Look around when you sing. This informs me in so many ways. I think I've even maybe even told my family at times, when we're singing, Look at the words and focus on the words. I think that's even instruction that I gave. And now I'm thinking, that's not helpful. Because, my goodness, how helpful is it for my family to, to look around and see one another and sing? So, so look around as you're singing. Uh, focus on Christ. Sing about Christ. But, but be mindful of one another. And look and see and observe others praising the Lord. And be encouraged by them. And visually... 
demonstrate a worshipful heart as you sing so that you can be an encouragement to one another as well. Be on time and, and look around. And, and here's another just a comment. Um, let's, in, in addressing one another, let's inform our children what it looks like to be singers. Like, I want my children to, to know that Christians sing so when they look out in front of them, behind them, to the side, they don't come home and say, why does so-and-so not sing? Or, you know, let, let, I want them to see men singing and know that that's a manly, godly thing to do, to sing. And so, so uh, you know, be, have that on your heart too. You're training this church to sing. So be on time, look around, sing loudly. You know, it's just an encouragement to, to hear those singing around you. Um, genuine praise to God. And, and here's the last one. Sing more often. I'd love to just get, get to share with you the highlights of, of, in our home of, of just singing together as a family. Um, and I'd encourage you to do the same. What, whatever your family context looks like, if, if you find yourself in a setting where, where you, you live by yourself, get together with other people throughout the week. And, and it's not weird to start that time together in, in a song. It might feel weird at first, but you'll probably get used to it. Let, let's sing together more often so that Sunday morning is not the only time you sing together. There are things we do to try and promote singing outside of the church. When you come here on a Sunday evening, you're handed songs to sing. Those don't have to be turned back in when you leave. Please take those with you. Learn the songs. Sing them together as a family. Buy a hymnal. Take it home with you. Uh, listen to songs as you travel. Listen to songs in your home. Uh, sing more often. Let's be characterized by song. We're commanded to. We're to be characterized by it. It's for our good. It's for God's glory. But um, my goodness, we have much to sing about. If you're here this morning and you're not in Christ, this may sound strange on many levels to you, everything we've talked about today. But, but God who is holy, sent his son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins so that we could be reconciled to God. That is your greatest need, to be reconciled to God. You may not even know until now that, that you, this may be the first time you've heard that you are, your sin has separated you from God and your greatest need is to be reconciled to God. Trust in Christ, turn to him, repent of your sin and, and trust in Christ and, and then you are a redeemed sin singer. Uh, you're, you're, a, you're a singer that has much to sing about, and, and every believer in this room has much to sing about. And so, so what a privilege it is for us to gather on Sunday and sing praises to God as we encourage one another in our songs. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this morning. We do delight in, in you and who you are and what you've done. We delight in what you're going to do. So much of our delight is displayed through our singing. We have much to sing about. and um, It encourages our hearts. It, it uh, pleases you. And so I pray that, that this instruction we're even confronted with this morning might, might encourage us to really grow in this area. For those who are doing well to continue and doing well. And for others who need to excel still more, and that all of us need to excel still more. May we, may we take this to heart and desire to glorify you in this aspect of our lives. May this inform our approach to why we gather. Um, may you be glorified in every aspect of our lives. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.